Welcome to the Be Bold for Jesus podcast. We go to those on the front lines nationwide, bringing you special guests and topics facing Christians in today's world. We discuss matters of family, work, communities, and our nation, covering how to overcome life's challenges and embrace being bold for Jesus in our walk, God's word, his promises, and how to share our faith boldly with others. Now let's get bold. Welcome to the Be Bold for Jesus podcast. I am your host, Keith Atneson, and today we have a special guest, Pastor Corey Kirkham with Calvary Rathdrum. Welcome, Pastor Corey. Hi, Keith. Welcome. It's good to, good to be with you. Well, I am excited to hear about um, your role in the Rathdrum community and also some of your experiences in Israel, which is a topic that we're going to touch on a little bit today. But before we jump into that, I'd love to hear just a little bit about your journey and how God brought you into this role uh, of pastoring in Rathdrum. Yeah, so I, I grew up nearby in Spokane, Washington, was raised uh, within the, the Lutheran church, but because of my own stupidity and stubbornness, I didn't come to Christ until uh, in high school, I was exposed to a ministry called Young Life and uh, met Christ through Young Life. I uh, graduated from high school and went off to the University of Washington and uh, began working in ministry with Young Life. Spent eight years, um, well beyond my college years, uh, ministering at a high school in inner city Seattle, uh, doing outreach ministry to high school students, and then uh, connected with a Calvary Chapel on the Olympic Peninsula across uh, Puget Sound from Seattle and Silverdale, Washington, and spent seven years there. And in the course of that time, got married. And uh, before long, my wife and I ended up re relocating back to Spokane. And I was on staff with uh, one of your uh, previous guests, recent guests, Pastor Ken Ortiz, and uh, spent six years serving under Ken, which is a, a wonderful experience. And uh, one Saturday night, Ken stepped into my office after service and asked me to come out to a Rathdrum uh, to preach the next morning. And I had to ask him, well, where's Rathdrum? And uh, I've been here ever since. That was uh, almost 20 years ago now. So, Yeah, so you've become part of the community, I think it's safe to say. Absolutely, yeah. And what are some of the changes that you've observed? You know, the last few years has been pretty dramatic migration of folks around the country, what's kind of been your experience in that regard? Uh, Rathrum has changed radically in the last 20 years. Uh, it's grown a lot, um, a huge influx of people, um, you know, a lot, a lot of things around the town, you know, you know, we certainly don't have traffic like most places do, but compared to 20 years ago, we call it traffic. So, um, but it's a, it's a great community. It's a family oriented community and uh, we love it here. It's, it's a beautiful place to be and to live. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, the church in terms of how you guys are engaging in the community. We're in, in an interesting season in the country where there's, uh, it seems like an increasing amount of friction. Um, and some of that's driven some of the folks to move towards North Idaho and, and the Rathrum community. And so, well, I think one of the big questions I have in my mind is how does the, the church engage in, yeah. in culture and in our communities and, and not just be um, hiding uh, inside, inside of our church building? Um, so what are some of your thoughts and perspectives around how now do we live um, in America? Oh, that, that, is, that is a huge issue, isn't it? I mean, that it, we are all about what you guys are all about. I love your um, you, you, your name, Be Bold for Jesus, and that is what we want our people doing. We, we talk a lot about the fact that we come together to know Jesus more in order that we might go out to make him known. I and mean, one, one of the realities is that on a Sunday morning when we gather, there's just a handful of us who are in part-time ministry, and we're in part-time ministry because we're here at a church building uh, a good part of our week, and, and we're only engaging in ministry out there part-time, but we've got a whole bunch of people who are coming in each Sunday in order to get equipped, 
and encouraged and filled up because they are out there in full-time ministry and doing the jobs that they do and raising their kids and engaging with the community. And so uh, one of the things that we, we talk about a lot is the fact that we are supposed to be connecting with the community and we're supposed to be reaching out and we've got a message to bring with us. You know, I think of this season that we're in, and man, you're right, there's a lot more friction than there used to be, isn't there? Uh, Christians are often finding themselves these days in a place where they're intimidated by the culture. They're hesitant to uh, not only to stand for the right to live out their faith, but also uh, to be bold enough to begin to share their faith and express it to others and express to them the hope they have. And, and yet, uh, you know, this is not a new dynamic for God's people. This is not a new dynamic for the church. Yeah, I think way back even to when uh, the Lord was sending his people Israel into captivity. So they're going as prisoners of war into Babylon. And, and one of the things that the prophet Jeremiah did to the people as they were heading out to Babylon was that God wanted them in Jeremiah 29 7 uh, to pursue the good of the city to which the Lord was deporting them uh, because when it thrived they would thrive how how much more for us uh, in this place that we have chosen to live that we are privileged to live uh, we are to be engaging with our culture, with our community, for the good of the community, because uh, when it thrives, we will thrive. And, you know, the, this whole thing, it, it, it's not something that's duty driven. It's not an obligation uh, that is going to move us into engaging with the community. But it's as we come to know Jesus more, uh, so as we know him from worship as we know him more from our time in the word as we understand better what it is that he's done for us and his great love for us that that this will become something not that we do because well we've got to we've got to check it off our list or we've got to you know if i don't do this the lord's not going to be happy with me it, it's not about that at all but it, the more i understand about who jesus is and and the amazing love that he has expressed for me, it becomes something that flows out of me. I, I can't hold it in. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, you know, I can't, I can't contain this. I can't constrain this. I've got to tell people about the love of Jesus. Um, he talks about it to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3. And um, he says this, since we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. And, and I love that because that, that really describes how the dynamic is supposed to be. It's not we have great boldness because uh, we don't care what anyone thinks or we have great boldness because, you know, we're just jerks at heart. But we have great boldness because we have been loved so greatly. You know, we're like obnoxious, newly engaged people. And we can't help but talk about Jesus because it, it's all we think about because he has loved us so greatly. Um, that great hope that we have, that's the grace of God. And the fact that, uh, as a friend of mine says, any day that I don't have to pay for my own sins, that's a good day. You know, the, the fact that I am forgiven and I am cleansed, and even more than that, that I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That is, that is great news for me, because I'd be without hope without that. Uh, in, in Romans 13, 14, Paul says this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And, and that, that in itself, too, is a, it's a great picture of how we're to live the Christian life, in, in that we put on Christ uh, both in the sense of, as I stand before God, as I consider my position before the Lord, uh, I am in Christ. I am covered with his righteousness. I am secure in my salvation because I know that what Christ did was enough. Uh, but also, as I go out to engage with the world, it's not about me. It's not about me being better than anyone else. It's not about me having my act together and they need to get their act together. I am in Christ, and that's the only, that's the only thing 
that I've got going. And, and so I can come to them to offer them this incredible gift that's been given to me. And I can live my life based on that dynamic that as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, that as we go out and we live within our communities, uh, it's not about me living my life, pursuing my agenda, uh, but it's the Lord living through me. It, it's him expressing his love for this community and to the lost people in it uh, through me. And, and a big part of that is me realizing and, and rejoicing in and sharing with others the goodness of what it is that he's done for me. Yeah, I, I love the uh, the idea of the exuberance, like someone who's newly engaged and uh, just can't keep it to themselves. Well, well we're going to take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. Join us October 13th through the 15th at the Spokane Convention Center for the Be Bold for Jesus Conference, featuring Greg Laurie of Jesus Revolution, Jeff Foxworthy, the funniest man you'll ever meet, Lee Strobel, author of A Case for Christ, Ken Ham of the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum, recording artist Danny Gokey, and founding member of Real Life Ministries, Pastor Jim Putman. You will be equipped to live out your faith in boldness and connect with like-minded believers who share your passion for Christ. Don't miss this life-changing event. Register now at bb4j.com. Well, Pastor Corey, you know, one of the things that uh, came to my mind uh, as as you were sharing about uh, how we can engage the community with with joy is just how much fear our culture has been, and especially since the whole COVID phenomena arrived. Uh, on one end of it, we've got a lot of fear that I might die or my grandma might die, and and some legitimate fear there uh, around health. And then on the other side of the equation, you had a lot of folks that were very fearful of. Uh, my government is telling me, here's how I, I can live, or my employer is telling me, here's how I need to live, uh, and I'm afraid of, of them exerting this control, and, and what you're sharing is really an alternate uh, option, which is to live in joy of knowing that we have hope in eternity through Christ. So I, I'd love for you to unpack a little bit more, just what does that look like for us to engage our community and not be in fear, um, but to share hope and joy? Uh, you know, the, the temptation is to respond to everything that's gone on and to everything that is going on uh, with anger, with frustration. And, and boy, no one likes being in those conversations. And so it's pretty natural for us to fear engaging with others who don't know the Lord, who, who don't see things uh, the way that we see them. Um, Great book by Rod Dreher written not too long ago in, entitled uh, Live Not By Lies. And he stole that title from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who, who wrote uh, during that Soviet era uh, about the fact that, you know, we as we live as believers within a community, within a culture that is opposed to us, uh, that we've got to live for truth and we've got to speak truth. And, and that dynamic can that can cause some fear because, it, you know, there are a lot of people believing all sorts of crazy things these days uh, about sexuality and gender and, and just uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, um, and it, it's so key for us that we, we come at this not from a perspective of frustration or anger, but of love and of joy that we need to speak the truth, but we need to, of course, speak it in love. Uh, we need to uh, approach these conversations uh, not as if we are approaching a debate where we want to win the topic, but rather uh, we're approaching a relationship and we want to win the person. We want to win the person to truth. We want to bring them to a place where the blinders are taken off, where they can begin to see. And, and there are there are so many great tools for us to use as we begin to gauge, engage in these things. Uh, one, of the, one of the amazing things of the day that we live in is uh, there are so many wonderful resources that can help equip us uh, to be able to begin to have conversations that don't just end with people yelling at each other, calling each other names and walking off. Uh, but instead beginning to engage in ongoing conversations about what is the nature of truth and what is the reality. Uh, you know, half this stuff 
uh, that is being foisted upon us by our culture. No one really believes it. I mean, they they know that they've got to toe the line or they're going to get, uh, you know, uh, chastised by the culture at large. Canceled, but so to speak. They, yeah. No one lives that way. It, it, you know, the, this whole thing of, you know, what is a woman and, and all of that. I'm pretty sure about 99% of the guys know what a woman is. You know, it, that, that just, it isn't truly an issue. Um, but we, we know that our culture is going to respond aggressively if, if we challenge that. And so we've got to know how do we approach this. And, and, and part of it is we got to love the person that we're talking to. And part of it is we've got to learn how to listen. And, and, you know, we've got to learn how to ask questions. Greg Koval's got a great book, Tactics, that can uh, kind of equip people for those kinds of conversations. Um, but the best thing you can do when someone says something that's just, you know, it's just, it, it's just straight up crazy juice. It, 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 it has no connection point with reality. It's, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah tell me what you mean uh, by this statement that there are more than two genders. Describe to me that. Help me to understand this. And then to begin to walk them back through uh, through steps of logic and the, the laws of logic to help them understand that, to see that, that their argument doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. Work. And, I, and I think a, a good starting point that most of us can agree on is we, we'd like to see human flourishing. And, and as followers of Christ, we believe everyone's an image bearer. And, and God loves everyone and, and wants humanity to flourish, but we are in this sinful world. And so if we can at least have that starting point, we, we agree, we want people to do well. We want humans to do well, uh, except for the occasional sociopath. Um, but, but then, yeah, it does move into, okay, you know, so what is the environment that that is conducive for humans to flourish? And, and that involves some sense of morality. And where do we get that from? A sense of what's right and what's wrong. That's right. And that's and that's where we have to turn to scripture. You know, this is this is where right and wrong come from. If there is no God, uh, Frank Turek's famous for saying that an atheist borrows from God whenever they make their arguments that have, in order to say that something is right or wrong, there has to be a God who is the definition of right or wrong. And so we want to begin to turn people to the scriptures. But uh, that today, People look at the scriptures and they they doubt them and they they assume that that they're just I had a, a lady tell me just the other day that you know her understanding of the Bible is that it was just stories that had been handed down over the years and changed over the centuries and, and that we really could have no um, assurance, no confidence that uh, the things that we read in the Bible are you know really true or really from God. And yet that is the furthest thing from the truth. And that kind of ties into the other thing that I was hoping we could talk about, and that's uh, Israel and, and, and taking people to Israel. And, and we live in an incredible time when we have opportunities to go and to, to see the land of Israel. And the reason that I love it, it isn't because I like to travel, because it, you know travel is miserable. It's getting there that's good. Uh, uh, but the reason I love it is we spend a full week all day long, day after day, looking at the evidence for the veracity of scripture and having a blast doing it and going from place to place, from site to site, seeing the real places and seeing the evidence of the real events and of the real people that scripture talks about, seeing the uh, the places that these things that we've read about over the years, where they took place and seeing the remains of the events uh, as they lie in state in the excavations uh, of the archaeologists. Um, oh, it's, a, it's an amazing place to visit. And it really does change the way that you envision scripture when you're reading it. Well, I, we do need to take another short break to hear from a sponsor. And then I'd love to hear more about your experience in Israel. The Lee Arnold System of Real Estate Investing is a system that teaches you the right ways to invest in real estate. We take the experiences that we learn out there in the field and we put them into our education and into our curriculum so that you are getting real-time, real-world experience. Whatever level you're at, it's time to level up and take your business to wherever it is you want to go next. Schedule your free consultation now. 
the Lee Arnold system of real estate investing, creating successful real estate investors nationwide. Call us today at 800-341-9918 or visit us online at learnoldsystem.com. So, Pastor Corey, how many times have you been to Israel? You know, I was trying to count up this morning. I think it's been six or seven, something along those lines. Awesome. I, I, I am a little bit envious. I, I was there once in 2010, but uh, really made a profound impact on me as you travel from these different places, from the Sea of Galilee to, to Jerusalem and Masada. And just amazing historical um, locations that a lot of scripture is um, contextually written around. What are some of the things that have impacted you uh, on your travels oh, to Israel? Man. I, I, I love going because of the things that you see. And, you know, there's so many places that we go where we see the things that took place in scripture. You can go up north uh, to a place called Tel Dan, and, and there you can actually go and see the remains of Jeroboam's altar. You, you remember that in, in 1 Kings 11 and 12? It's one of those ugly incidences in scripture. Uh, Jeroboam uh, takes over the divided kingdom. He becomes the king of Israel. Well, where while Rehoboam is over Judah, uh, but Jeroboam's worried that the people are going to begin returning to the temple down in Judah, and so he builds two altars, and one of them is up in Tel Dan, and they have actually excavated the place where the altar was, and you can go there and you can see this. This this isn't just a story. It, it, Jeroboam isn't just a fictional character. These are things that actually took place and you can go and you can see them. Uh, when you're there, you're just footsteps away from uh, the ancient city of Laish where uh, Abraham traveled. And, and so you can see a city gate that very likely, I, I think assuredly, Abraham himself would have passed through it. Um, you can go to places like Shiloh where the tabernacle was set up. And, and we read about that in 1 Samuel, there in chapter 1 and onward, uh, where Hannah comes and she is begging God to, to hear her prayer. And uh, God gives her little Samuel, and Samuel grows up there at the tabernacle. And we read about all these things taking place. And there are excavations going on at Shiloh even now. And, and they're uncovering the things that you would expect them to find in a place where sacrifices were taking place. Uh, you can go to uh, places like the Pool of Siloam. Pool of Siloam is amazing right now. Now, you were there in 2010, um, and so a lot has changed since then at the Pool of Siloam. So the first time I went to the Pool of Siloam, uh, we traveled through Hezekiah's tunnel and came out uh, to a pool of water, and um, that was where they believed the Pool of Siloam was. Well, things have changed, and they made some new discoveries. In 2005, an archaeologist by the name of Eli Shukran, um, he was uh, walking past a, a construction site where they were actually digging up a sewer pipe that had broken, and uh, he heard a bulldozer's blade scraping across stone. Mm -hmm. And as an archaeologist, that set off all his alarms. And so he goes into the construction site, he stops their work, and he uncovers some cut stone. And they begin to examine it all. Well, lo and behold, here is the Pool of Siloam, a slightly different exit from Hezekiah's tunnel. And so for uh, the past you know, 15 years, uh, just a small portion of the Pool of Siloam was excavated. Uh, at the same time, they were able to tie together uh, some things that had been discovered uh, back in the 1800s, actually, of a roadway that led from that the area of the Pool of Siloam all the way up to the southwest corner of the temple. And it was the route that the pilgrims would take. They would use the Pool of Siloam as a mikvah to cleanse themselves before going up to worship at the temple. And then they would walk up this road. Now that roadway has been excavated. Of course, it's underground because it was buried in the many uh, centuries of rubble. And so there's a tunnel now that you can follow the roadway up from the Pool of Siloam all the way up to the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. 
Um, and then very recently, the city of David was able to purchase the property that the rest of the pool of Siloam should be in. And they've begun to excavate that. And that's very interesting because as they've excavated it, they haven't found it. And so now there's a mystery afoot. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, well, are we not digging deep enough? Um, or were the stones taken for one of the different reconstruction projects over the centuries? And so there's just so much information and, and so much that you can find. Uh, but the thing that I love about it is it all ties back to scripture. And, you know, you look at this, you think back to 2 Kings 20, where uh, the Assyrians are coming and King Hezekiah takes the water coming from the Gihon Spring, which is the water source for Jerusalem. And they, they dig a tunnel, they start at both ends and they dig to the middle, all without modern technology. And they only miss by like an inch, you know, that just offsets slightly. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. It really is. yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they were not primitive as we think of primitive uh, but that you can walk through that tunnel that leads you to the pool of siloam and, and now uh, it wasn't open the last time i was there but now you can actually walk up that pilgrim's road uh, towards the temple mount from there just as the pilgrims did during the time of jesus awesome well you know and there's a lot of places in the world that you could travel to and, and see historical things or have a, an experience. But as believers, um, I, I've heard it said before that we're all really called to become theologians yeah. in that we're, we're in the study of God. And so the, the opportunity to visit the Holy Land and to see uh, the actual places where things transpired, I think really does um, encourage us and inspire us to be more engaged in, in both our study of scripture, but also in our conviction um, and sharing it. Yeah, and that's that's the value to doing this as we come home and uh, the people that we engage with who are under the delusion that scripture is full of myths and fairy tales, we can sit down with them and begin to talk about, okay, well, what do you think is a fairy tale here? Is it people? Is it the places? Is it the events? Uh, because I've been to Nazareth. I've been to Bethlehem. I've been to the southern steps of the temple. And, and you know, I've seen the remains of, of Solomon's chariot city at Megiddo and, and that he wasn't supposed to have, by the way. Um, and, you know, we can go and we can see the evidence of these things. And we can even see evidence um, of the people. Uh, you know, a signet ring of Pilate that was discovered at the Herodium just outside of Bethlehem not, not that long ago. Uh, of course, there's the, the Pilate stone that was discovered at Caesarea Maritima, a, a dedication plaque uh, to Pontius Pilate that had been recycled and was being used as either a seat or a stepping stone in the theater uh, there in Caesarea Maritima. Um, and, and so all of these different things that, that point us to the reality that, no, it, it isn't fairy tales, it isn't myths, these are real people, real places, and real events, and we can trust what God's word says. You can go to uh, En Gedi and, and, and see uh, where, where David hid from Saul, and you can hike up to the waterfall there, and, and, and you, know, you can go to the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, were were discovered where the Essenes had set up a community, and, and you know there's there's so much there that that speaks to the uh, the reliability of the scriptures, and and so yeah, it, it, it's a worthwhile thing if it's something that's a possibility for you. I know you guys are getting ready to take a tour, um, and we're taking one. I, I think actually we're about the same time. So we're in September of 2024. What okay. Are you He's the solution. Uh, ministries will be having a tour going in October. Yeah. The, the October. specific. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the actual dates are going to be November uh, 5th okay. through the 14th. Yeah. And that's Perfect. that's 2024. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and what a what a great thing. And and for those who are are, are nervous about all the things going on in Israel. Uh, I've had I've had friends on trips there over the last three months. Uh, some of them uh, during the probably the, the high point of the of the chaos. And, and really, the only reason they knew stuff was going on is they saw it on the news. And yeah, uh, 
your guys. Well, there's, there's a certain amount of risk wherever we're spending time in the world. Uh, and I would say most likely Israel is one of the safer environments, uh, depending on, on who you're with and where you are. But uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's I'd great. rather be in any place in Israel than ever be in Detroit or Chicago. I would agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a great encouragement for folks. Um, you know, even if it's not possible to travel there, just be aware. And an amazing uh, you know, museum of the Bible is just continuing to find so many things that support the context of scripture and for believers to, to be confident. Um, that that there's real historical relevance um, to our faith and God's word, and yeah. that we can be encouraged by that and and be able to be bold in that knowledge and, and how we interact with our community. Well, do you have any last encouragement for listeners as um, they're going through their their day to day life? Um, how to how to take steps forward in being bold? You know, I think the thing that I would say more than anything is just draw close to the Lord. It's as you come to know Jesus more that you will be more equipped to go and to make him known. Uh, spending that time in the word and, and asking the Lord to, to speak to your heart and, and not just knowing information, but asking him to, to do the work that he does. I, I was uh, reading this morning in 2 Corinthians and how uh, as as we draw close to the Lord, uh, that he transforms us. He does this work within us. And, and you will be not only equipped with knowledge, but you will be equipped with a love for the Lord that will shine through and that will speak to others. Well, on that note, uh, Pastor Corey, would you be willing to close our time in prayer um, and just pray over our listeners as uh, as they go out into their days? Absolutely. Lord, I just thank you so much for uh, the ministry of, of Be Bold for Jesus, and he's the solution ministries, and God, what you're doing there, and God, for the, the listeners, for those who are, are, are looking at all of this and wanting to be bold, God, that you would just pour out your spirit on them, and you would draw them close to yourself, you'd open your word to them, God, that as they draw close to you and as they know you more, that you would equip them to make you know. God, I pray that we would be people who make a difference in our communities, who have an impact on this world, that we would occupy until you come. And Lord, we look forward to that day and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Corey, thanks again for taking time. And uh, to our listeners, we thank you for listening as well. And we look forward to our next episode. Take care. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you have been empowered by today's discussion. The Be Bold for Jesus podcast is supported by listeners just like you. So be sure to subscribe and share the Be Bold for Jesus podcast. We appreciate any donations God may put on your heart in support of this podcast, our weekly He's the Solution ministry sermons, the thousands of free Bibles that we send out annually, and the Be Bold for Jesus annual conference. God bless you, and be sure to tune in next week.